Welcome to the inaugural season of Live from Elm Court, a series of recitals given by emerging stars under the auspices of the Frederick R. Koch Foundation and coming to you from the magnificent Koch Estate in Pennsylvania, Elm Court. The season spans the eras from Monteverdi to today, including a premiere, and celebrates the worlds of opera, art song, piano, Broadway, theater, and dance, often featuring works collected in original manuscript form by Mr. Koch and donated to Yale University. Tonight's concert features Sylvia Doramo, soprano, Michael Hawk, baritone, Chris Carbon, bass baritone, and Louis Loriseb, piano, in an evening of beloved opera arias. Quando men vo from Puccini's La Boheme. This is the famous Act Two aria sung by the character Musetta, who is one of my favorite characters to portray because I think we don't have too much in common personally, Musetta and I. And so it's fun to step into the shoes of someone so um, flirtatious and vivacious and um, a little hot-headed. Um, and I'm sure all of you will recognize this aria. It is now in a lot of commercials and movies and <laughs> you'll recognize the theme, absolutely. Count is not the same count we remember from Il Barbieri di Siviglia. We get a licentious nobleman who is after his servant's fiance, Susanna. He's just had a duet with her where they've arranged to meet in the garden. And as she's leaving, he overhears her say, don't worry, Figaro, without a lawyer, you've already won this case. And the count repeats that, I già vinta la causa and he explodes into this glorious rage aria. One of my favorites in the repertoire. Hai già vinta la causa, cosa sento in quella gioia area? Cermio la 
sentenza sarà. Ma se i pagasse la vecchia pretendente, pagarla in qual maniera? Figaro ricusa di dare una nipote in matrimonio. Coltivando l'orgoglio di questo mentecatto. Molto giova un raggino.
called Robert Wakujeme from Meyerbeer's Robert le Diable. This one is not really in standard operatic repertoire so much because it's French Grand Opera. It's a huge production to put on and I think the aria is the best part of the show. <laughs> um, this character that I'm portraying is Isabel and she is in a predicament because her fiance has done something bad in that he sold his soul to the devil yeah. and um she's a good catholic girl so this is not the preferred situation for her so the aria is her pleading with him to please reconsider i'm at your knees i'm asking you to please maybe don't do this <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm sure you all have heard it. It is one of the most quoted musical arias in all of the operatic repertoire. You probably know it from the Bugs Bunny goes to the opera, but I know it from the Burger King commercial. And uh, in this uh, aria, Fitz's Figaro's entrance aria, and he, he comes in with all this energy and he says, I'm the handyman of this entire town. I make things happen. I not only shave faces and make wigs for the nobility, but I also exchange notes between lovers and everyone comes to me. La 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 la
Actually prepared entirely with my dear friend Louis Lorseb, the assistant conductor at the LA Opera, um, and so um, I, I had so much fun uh, working on this piece with Louis and uh, writing these ornaments together. So it's a da capo aria, which um, for for any audience members that don't know what that is, it's an A section, it's a B section, and then you return to the A section with ornamentation. And so all of this ornamentation between Louis and I was a collaborative effort to come up with. So just as a musical experience, it was so much fun to put it together and then to get to perform it in this way. Turandot, which was very dramatic, and 
probably also on, you know, you've heard it's standard rep and it's so beautiful and sad and heartbreaking. one holds a special place in my heart uh, because of the great emotion and sensitivity that Billy shows in this moment. He's being held up in the barracks for unintentionally killing the master of arms, John Claggart. And it is the, it's the Christ story. So before he is sentenced to death and about to be hung the night before he looks at the moon and enjoys life for one final moment and he decides that this, is, this doesn't control his fate. He chooses optimism in this rather dark moment.
that's all, 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 and that's I don't know if we'll have subtitles or not, but probably most of the audience uh, is not fluent in Russian. And if they were, uh, they might not understand my diction. Um, but um, that being said, the entire piece sort of encapsulates this uh, real coming to terms with one's own situation. So Alyeko has left Russian society at large and he's joined a, a, effectively a group of nomads. Uh, he's fallen in love with Semfira, who's a much younger woman than him. Um, and it's, it's the realization that this society doesn't function in the same way that the society that he is accustomed to does. Um, so Zemfira has fallen in love with another man and that is, that's just the way the society works. And the coming to terms with that or the realization of that drives him to near madness. It does drive him to madness. He ends up uh, committing murder in the end. Um, and so we see this sort of uh, encapsulation of uh, his realization of... Uh, the situation at hand and eventually his conclusion that his partner has been unfaithful um, and that this is just the most destructive thing that could possibly happen for somebody who's given up his entire life for this woman. Um, so just the, this, the emotional gravity of, of that piece in particular I think is a really special thing. Uh, and it's also a very famous piece of Russian literature. Um, there are very few people, very few Russians that aren't familiar with the story of Alyeko. It's by Pushkin. So that's sort of uh, within the zeitgeist of what it is to to be Russian and to experience Russian art firsthand.
You know, performing arias, you know, as a conductor who also plays the piano, I think it's a very interesting sort of uh, spot to be in because when you are conducting, you are remembering what it was like to have that tactile experience of making the music uh, with the performers actually making sound. And, you know, then when you're conducting, you are trying to facilitate sound being made. So it's a different experience. And then on the other side, when you um, are playing the arias, you always, uh, or I at least, try to have the sound of the orchestra in my ear and try to create for the singers that sense of what they might feel. Um, often, part of our job, people who play arias, uh, pianists, uh, conductors who are pianists, anyone really who plays for singers in arias, one of the jobs that they have to do is sort of decode what a person has decided to do because of course the composer has written for many many different instruments and now it's been put into one instrument which has many great capabilities but has one really serious issue that it decays as soon as you hit a note on the piano that note goes away so beautiful bass notes that sustain or a flute which lingers on and such you 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 really need to try your best to imitate and a person has meticulously tried to make what they think is best and put it into a piano part. But of course, uh, we're all human. And so uh, part of our job is to take what someone has done and try to make sure it's the best possible rendering for the singers of what they have heard in the past. 
with an orchestra. Uh, that being said, there's a wonderful intimacy that you get with these arias and um, it's a wonderful experience to hear them and to he have the singers be able to really concentrate on what the arias mean. Let me think. Quando Van Vo obviously is just deceptively difficult to sing. I think it's standard rep for sopranos, but it is so hard. So, <laughs> you know, listen to all those big jumps and... <laughs> well, I would say that as a listener, I would definitely enjoy the Billy Bud, the first half of the Billy Bud, because for one moment in time, a baritone's not going to be screaming at you the whole time. You get a moment of beauty and tranquility before he bursts out into his final farewell to ye old rights of man. And if you think about what an aria is, um, it's a reflection most often. I mean, in the, in the, in the classical sense, if you look at a, a, a Mozart opera, for example, you have recitative, recitative, let's go with recitativo, I'm not very good at doing it in English, um, where um, the singers are with just a harpsichord often, maybe a forte piano, and they advance the plot. So it's a very speaky way of singing, which allows the plot to happen, sort of like the dialogue in a musical. And then Mozart creates arias, which are there to showcase the singer's uh, technical ability, their musicianship, but also, in terms of the drama, to reflect upon what's happening. It's much more vulnerable than being on stage with your colleagues and able to really delve into the character and not so much feel like, okay, here's Sylvia singing an aria. You really are able to hide behind the character and be completely delved in and having your colleagues on stage and having that added energy and the energy of the orchestra. And so when you're performing in concert, you really have to bring that all from like the depths of within and <laughs> muster that energy yourself. It's definitely difficult when we don't have the set and other characters and costumes. Uh, but I find I have trouble sometimes rail, reeling in my performance in front of a piano. Usually my pianist is saying, get back here. I can't hear you when you're walking all over the stage. So I, it, is, it is difficult, but sometimes it's a lot more fun to just imbue a performance more with character that you wouldn't necessarily get when you're in the given circumstance in the set. It's a completely different environment um, to perform in one space versus another space, and that can even differ between recital spaces, how you want to present something. Um, and so in this particular instance, we're performing in the most beautiful drawing room. Uh, so it allows for a real intimacy of, of performance. Um, and so you have to sort of tailor to your space uh, as well as tailor to the differences between what you have in a set and what you have uh, on a minimally dressed stage with a piano. Um, and so most of that has to come internally from your gauging of the situation at hand as well as the music that you're presenting. Um, so uh, Sylvia, for example, sings Musetta's Waltz from Bohème, and usually that is staged in such a way that you're dancing around between tables, you're flirting with chorus members, you're, you're doing everything you can to engage with other members on stage, and when that entire uh, situation becomes a vacuum, you have to do some very tricky things and, and really create this scene and create this character um, in a completely different way. But it doesn't mean you're not working with a character. It doesn't mean you can't be in touch with uh, the character you're singing and the, the intentions behind it. And so I think without the set and, and without the costumes and without the staging, uh, it really calls on you to be more of an artist, more of an individualistic artist than you might have been otherwise.